And welcome to this DOE virtual learning session. Uh, my name is Joe Schmidt. I'm the Social Studies Specialist for the Maine Department of Education. Today I'd like to uh, welcome Heather Morin from the Maine State Archives. She's going to talk today about uh, teaching with primary sources and telling us all about the resources that you can find online at the State Archives and some different ways to use them in your classrooms and answer any questions you might have. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Heather to the group. Thank you very much, Joe, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm excited to share um, some of my favorite parts of the Maine State Archives collections with all of you. Uh, so as Joe said, uh, my name is Heather Moran, and I am the reference and outreach archivist at the Maine State Archives. So let me jump right into this. Um, so the Maine State Archives is actually a bureau under the Secretary of State. Sometimes people think we fall under the legislative branch. Um, we are under the Secretary um, and we have two divisions. So Archive Services and Records Management. I work in the Archive Services Department and a way to think about the distinction between the two is that Archive Services primarily is concerned about um, records that we consider permanent. They have permanent historical value and we need to um, care for those in perpetuity um, you know, uh, for, to maintain the records of the state. The records management division um, are, are more um, records that are considered non-permanent. So we hold them for a period of time and then they are disposed of according to set schedules um, and those are set by each individual agency staff at the archives um, and that sort of thing but like i said i work in the cool section which is archive services and i tell people that i have the, the coolest job in the world because i get to amuse myself with all these great historical records every day um, we have about 95 million pages of records and counting um, so I will be a thousand years old before I process all of them. Um, as I mentioned, we have records from um, all the branches of government, as well as all of the state agencies. So Department of Transportation, Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, that sort of thing. My job is primarily outreach. Um, I do a lot of digitization of our collections and um, I'm really honing in the last couple of years um, on developing a more robust outreach program for visitors, for students, um, learners of all ages. So before I came to the archives in 2016, um, I was director of the History Center at the Camden Public Library. So I come at my current position wearing two hats. Um, I'm a trained librarian and a trained archivist. And so for me, um, it's all about access, access to information. And so if we can develop ways to reduce barriers for learners and get information out online for people, um, that is the primary part of my job. Um, so, in thinking about how to get information out there, I was looking at how the archives did outreach um, in the past, and they've done tours and, and um, they've sent um, archivists and the, the state archivists out into the schools to talk about different subjects, but I also wanted to make um, the archives more public facing. Um, I think a lot of people still are astonished that um, they can walk into the archives and request to look at collections and um, you know, dive into the records of Maine in that way. Um, we are considered closed stacks in the sense that you cannot browse our collections like you would say in a library. Uh, you sort of have to know what you're coming in to look at um, and make that request and then we will bring those documents to you. 
but it's not an easily browsable collection. And that's something that we are trying to change by putting more of our records online. Um, and as far as tours go, um, you know, we invite school groups or individuals in to tour the archives. Uh, in the past, that's consisted of, you know, taking them underground. We do have um, a couple floors underground, showing them the vault where we keep some of our most precious um, historical uh, material, including the First Maine Constitution. But we didn't really have any sort of a program to do a deeper dive, particularly with students, um, you know, into the collections. And so that's something that um, I started thinking about with my colleagues at the Maine State Library and at the Maine State Museum um, in the fall of last year. And what we wanted to do was come up with some sort of a, a teaching program that would not only be effective if students came in and booked time in the library or in the archives um, to study you know, a certain topic, whether it's the Civil War, um, Wabanaki, that sort of thing, um, but also make it portable for you as educators to be able to have some sort of a packaged supplementary cu curriculum um, that you could download and work with in your classrooms without having to have a um, archives library or museum facilitator there. So we started talking and we came up with a plan to develop these primary source sets. I know that my colleagues at the museum um, talked on Wednesday about these primary source sets in depth. So I don't want to um, repeat everything that they said, but I will touch on them a little bit later in my presentation. Um, so the goal was, uh, you know, to have the students be able to look at primary and secondary sources, put them in conversation with each other, evaluate them critically, and then come to their own conclusions about what the authors of these different documents we're trying to convey. So as part of this presentation today, I was thinking about some of my favorite collections and how they could be paired with what you are teaching your students. So as you can see on the screen, I've got a, a list of um, basic subjects that I came up with and ways that um, our collection could link out with those. So for example, if you are teaching a unit on European exploration, I would direct you perhaps to our ba Baxter Rare Map collection. Let me pull an example here for you. This is a, a favorite map of mine. It's beautifully uh, hand colored. It's from 1684 and shows the um, basically New England seaboard um, as early surveyors saw it in the 1600s. Um, this might be a fun thing for your students to take a look at. Uh, not only are the landforms very odd to um, how we know them today, um, but this one in particular, I want to draw your attention to just because um, I thought it was fun that they sort of made up things as they went along. If, for example, they didn't know of the extent of the Great Lakes, but if you look over here, I don't know if you can, whoops, I don't know if you can see my cursor right here, um, but they call the, one of the Great Lakes the Grand Lake of the Sweet Sea, which I think is rather lovely. So we have an entire collection of these Baxter rare maps. Um, they were a gift from James Finney Baxter. He was a philanthropist and mayor of Portland, and his son Percival became governor of Maine. So um, these records are available on our website called Digital Maine, and I'll touch on this more in a little bit, but um, to access these digital uh, records, you go to digitalmain.com. And from there, you will reach this landing page and you can dive into the collection. This is a, a collaboration between the Maine State Library and the Maine State Archives. 
And there are other institutions that have added content here as well, uh, the University of Maine being one of them. So it really is a very robust uh, website for you to start diving into the records of the state. So I mentioned maps. Um, to get to the maps in Digital Maine, I've got this link right here. So this is what it looks like. Um, you land here, there's a description of the map collection, and this by no means is the complete collection. Um, we are adding more maps um, as time allows. It does say here we have a collection of more than 2,000. Uh, I think that needs to be changed because I know that there are many, many more than that. Um, I have cataloged a number of these um, until my eyes cross. So uh, you can browse the map collections here. We have Atlantic Coast pilot charts, which were um, rather early maps of the seaboard. Atlases, I'm gonna show this to you because um, we often have requests for town histories or uh, you know, looking at the changes in your town or your county over time. So an atlas from you know, the late 1800s might be an interesting way to go in and look at um, the towns, um, the development of the county itself. There's all of these atlases vary a little bit in their content. So some have extensive histories of the county and of the towns, and some are much more basic um, in terms of just being the maps. Uh, so this one, for example, we've got uh, the city of Augusta and Chelsea. These are thumbnails. Um, these maps have been scanned at a very high resolution. So when you download them, your students will be able to see the fine detail of the maps. Some of these maps have um, homeowners, business owners names on them. Um, they can see how roads and boundaries have changed over time. So uh, this is an interesting way for them to get into um, a local history. Let me get back here. And if you have questions, again, please feel free to stop me. Um, York County, um, the oldest county in Maine, this one is interesting because the creators of the Atlas have taken a lot of time to flesh out the histories of the different towns. So you've got Kittery, Lyman, Berwick, um, a general description of the county itself. You have to go actually a few pages in before you get to the maps, but they are in there. Um, in wonderful detail. So again, this might be a way for your students to do a social history of their town, um, a geography lesson, um, or something of that sort. And again, these are all found under the map collection section of Digital Maine. I did mention the Baxter Rare Maps, um, the example I showed you from 1684. Um, when you first go into Digital Maine, sometimes the view will look a little bit different. Quite often it defaults to this particular view, um, which is great if you just want a general overview of you know, how many maps are in the collection, what they look like. But if you are trying to find a particular map, all you have to do is click up here where it says switch view and that will change it for you. Um, and you can also do uh, a term here up on the left upper hand corner. And all of those have descriptions um, to better enable your students to understand what they are looking at. Our fire tower maps are pretty neat. Um, I have heard of teachers using these 
to teach math. Um, you know, I'm not sure how you would do that. Um, the, but again, these are at a high resolution once you download them. Um, so your students could certainly um, practice um, math skills using those. And finally, um, one of my favorites, only because I spent so long with them, are these plan book maps. Um, the plan books, these were prepared um, by Maine and Massachusetts when the states, um, when Maine was splitting apart from Massachusetts. And so they did extensive mapping to determine the boundaries of the new state, um, laying out settlements and that sort of thing. So these are a great way for students to take a look at the growth and the development of the state over time. There is a lot of duplication. There are something like 26 plan books. For whatever reason, um, we find that there are duplicates of maps within different plan books. Um, so for example, you know, I could find this plan of Township 12 Range 4, both in um, plan book three and perhaps in plan book 12. So there is a little bit of overlap, but there are uh, descriptions um, of each map. The titles here are taken from the title that is actually written on the map itself. The creators are the surveyors, Silas Holman and Daniel Rose. Um, and here is that description. Uh, it also gives scale. Um, so if your students were interested in um, studying that, um, they can do that that way. Not every map has a scale written on it, oddly, um, but most of them do. And then we've also incorporated different features found in the map. So for example, if the Scudic River or uh, Piscataquis River are noted on the map, we've also tried to note it in um, this location field, and that enables searching. Um, you know, searchability and access is the key here. So we want to provide as many access points um, to these maps and our collections as possible. So I think that's pretty much it for mapping. We do have some planned books for the different counties. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the digital main digitization of records is ongoing. So, um, you know, please always check back because we are adding new items um, as often as we possibly can. So, um, back to subjects. If you're studying colonization, um, Revolutionary War, uh, we can offer you, for example, the 1637 Charter from Charles I of England, um, setting up the province of Maine. These are found in the York County court records. Uh, these are exceptionally fragile. We do have the bound originals downstairs in the archives, but they've also been uh, microfilmed by the Mormons, um, and they have been placed on their website, Family Search, um, and I do have a link here. I'll just show you real quick. This uh, links directly to those York County Court Records. Court of Common Pleas, for example. Um, this is a great resource for your kids. Um, and everything that has a little um, camera image next to it means you can click into it. It will bring up the microfilm image. Let's just pick one here. So these are the original court records, as I said, on microfilm. Um, they are in black and white, unfortunately, um, but it's still very much accessible to students and, and learners. Uh, more maps again. Um, you can Heather. see. 
real quick, um, we've got some questions. Do you have resources such as James Finney Baxter's The Pioneers of New France Digitized? And do you have the MOCA, MOCA books, digitized or microfilm, just missing the availability of libraries, museums, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So any published materials would be found at the state library um, or other libraries. We don't hold published records in the archives. Um, so you could definitely contact my colleagues at the state library for any published material. Um, and then the MOCA records, I believe those are also findable on Family Search. We do have um, some cemetery records and things like that, primar primarily related to the, um, the Civil War soldiers. Um, but the MOCA records, you're referring to the Old Cemetery Association, um, those are not generated by the state. So what, what we hold are records produced by the state. Um, so the MOCA records, I believe those are online if you do a Google search. Did that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Um, so back to uh, some of the collections, Revolutionary War, I mentioned. Um, we have fewer records from the Revolution and from the War of 1812. Uh, primarily because Maine was not yet its own state. We fell under the jurisdiction of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And those records, um, the majority are retained by Massachusetts. We do have some though. Um, for example, we've got uh, the Soldiers of Valley Forge. And then of interest to our genealogists and students of the the early um, colonial revolutionary war period, um, we have these affidavits from revolutionary war soldiers. Um, and at the time the affidavits were filed, um, these veterans were old men. Uh, a number of these were done in the 1830s because the state realized it really needed to pay these gentlemen for their service in the war. Um, and in order to receive um, monetary compensation, usually in the form of land, um, the soldiers had to give a recollection of their service. And so these records are quite interesting. Not only does it give you um, their description of their own service, um, what companies they were in, um, what battles they, they saw, um, but often it gives a bit of a social history in that, they also um, describe their current circumstances. Are they, are they destitute? Are they living with family members? You know, uh, what sort of personal items do they have? How many pots do they have? Do they have, um, you know, uh, how, many, how much silverware or beds or what have you? So it's interesting to read through these uh, and get a sense of what the soldiers saw during that early formative period of our country but also um, their current situation in Maine. And you can get to those through Digital Maine, Revolutionary War. Um, we have Hancock County, we have uh, some Massachusetts. This is not a complete collection by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, a number of these are still held by Massachusetts, but we've digitized what we've got and they are searchable by um, veterans last name. So, um, again, War of 1812, uh, not as many resources. We do have a few ledgers. Those are in the process of being scanned, um, so they are not um, yet findable on digital main, but should be shortly. If you're studying early statehood, um, obviously a big topic uh, for this year, this is our state's bicentennial year. So we made, we the staff of the archives made a concerted effort to scan um, all of the items relating to early statehood. Um, you know, the jewel in the crown, 
so to speak, is the Constitution, the first Constitution of the State of Maine. Um, we have digitized that in its entirety. Um, again, these are very large files, so be patient if you do try to download them. But we scan them at a high resolution to make all the wonderful details um, visible to your students. One thing you might want to do um, is compare and contrast the draft copy of the 1819 Constitution with the final version. Um, I find it fascinating to look at this draft copy, which you can see up on the screen, um, because it's interesting for students to take a look and sort of get inside the heads of um, the convention attendees to see what words are they choosing? What phrases are they choosing? They want to pick exactly the right words to convey uh, the meaning of um, you know, the Constitution in setting up our new state. So it's fascinating to look at the annotations and the cross outs and that sort of thing. Um, all of the statehood documents are available on digital main under statehood. Uh, so we've got the act of separation documents, all of the acts and resolves. Uh, we've got the main constitution, which you just saw, and then documents from the constitutional convention. So for example, in the act of separation gallery, um, we have these early survey books of Joseph Norris um, and his fellow surveyors. These gentlemen went out into the wilds of Maine to map the length and breadth of, of the new state. And it's interesting because you can read their descriptions. Uh, you know, sometimes for students, maybe it's a little dry because they talk a lot about soil composition and, you know, how many trees are, uh, and types of trees are growing in a certain area. Um, but it really is um, a description of the formation of the state. So they can track that over time by looking at not only our maps, the early plan book maps, but these survey books, um, it's interesting for students to realize that, you know, there was a world before iPhones and computers and GPS. Uh, you know, these were men going out into the wilds of Maine, dragging their canoes uh, and their survey chains behind them, trying to get a sense of this great vast state. Um, also with the um, early statehood documents, we have the Wabanaki collection. Um, this is a collection that is um, by no means complete. We are still working on processing it, but um, archive staff has pulled together a number of treaties and uh, correspondence, that sort of thing, from the tribes um, in relation to the tribal relationship with the state, uh, primarily Passamaquoddy and Penobscot tribes. And you get to those through um, the native tribal documents. So you can see everything from the early 1793 records, um, laying out tracts of land on the Scudic River um, to this treaty between Massachusetts and the Penobscot nation. Again, you can click into it. Many of these items um, also have a transcription. So again, not wanting to create any sort of barrier to access for students who may not be able to read cursive. Um, we have made a concerted effort to have items um, transcribed for them. All right, so again, uh, I've talked a lot about digital mean. Um, this is the splash page, the landing page for digital mean. Um, to get to the archives services specific collections, it's digitalmean.com forward slash arc, A R C underscore 
IMG, like archives images. This is where you land. This shows you all of the items in the archives collections. And you can scroll down through, like I mentioned, we have legislative documents, um, the maps, we have photograph collections. I know Nikki Ladner touched on this a little bit in her talk this morning. Um, the George French collection, uh, students seem to enjoy. Uh, these were photographs of Maine taken, um, you know, turn of the century, 1920s, 1930s. Um, he was a photographer for the state, and um, these are fun for our students to take a look at, you know, sort of uh, life in the past. Um, this one is at Poland Spring, um, a bunch of, looks like young college students going out for a sleigh ride in the wintertime. So that's something interesting we have in our collection. Um, in recent months, we've gotten a lot of inquiries about slavery in Maine. Um, this is a topic that we on the primary source sets team decided to develop a, a set of documents for, um, sort of an educational um, learning experience for, um, because a number of students really don't realize that there was, in fact, slavery in Maine. I've focused on this um, because we have a number of documents relating to the Atticus the Slave case. It was a, a famous case of a young man named Atticus who stowed away on a schooner out of Islesboro, Maine. He stowed away in Georgia and then rode this, um, sailed with the schooner back up to Maine uh, with the slave catchers in hot pursuit. Unfortunately, he was captured and sent back, but this kicked off a very long, decades long, protracted um, battle between Georgia and Maine, and on a larger scale between the Southern states, um, pro-slavery states, and the northern states. Um, so I highlighted this because it's it shows how you can dive into the collections, the varied collections within the state archives. So relating to Atticus, we have uh, an affidavit from James Saggers, who was the owner of the slave. Um, and then He's basically saying, you know, he's stowed away, he's disappeared, I want him sent back. We have a request for extradition of the schooner captains from the governor of Georgia. Um, we have a number of letters back and forth, increasingly angry letters from the governor of Georgia to the governor of Maine, um, because the uh, Maine uh, found every reason to not pursue extradition of the schooner captains. So again, you can trace this through time. Um, we have the extradition request from Georgia for the schooner captains again, back and forth, back and forth over many, many years. Um, so this is interesting for students to take a look at. Again, these documents have been transcribed. Um, so the old handwriting should not be a barrier. Um, again, this is just an example of uh, the extradition request. So this is how it looks on digital Maine. Um, so for example, we've got this letter supporting um, Captain Philbrook of Islesboro against this charge of slave stealing. Um, you can download it, you can download the transcription, and there's an extensive description of the letter itself. Now, if you wanted to take a look at the transcription, you would download it and it would look like this. So it is a perfectly readable text for students. Um, our volunteers and staff who have transcribed our material, we have asked them to deliberately leave in the you know, odd spellings 
or strange punctuation or lack of punctuation um, so that it stays true to the document itself. And that's always interesting for students too, to, to have a look at the old styles of, of spelling, handwriting, and punctuation um, before everything was standardized. So we developed a sister site um, along with digitalmain.com. We developed digitalmain.net, which is our transcription project, again, recognizing that uh, cursive is a challenge for newer learners and wanting to make these as accessible as possible. So this is our transcription project. And this is something that students or teachers, anybody, can volunteer to help us with. All it requires, it's very simple. Uh, this would be great for older learners like um, you know, high school students perhaps, or um, you know, advanced middle schoolers if they wanted to take a crack at transcribing one of these old state documents. We would love that. Um, all they have to do is down here in the lower left, uh, they just register. Um, and then they'll get their own login and they could go right to town. So let me show you what that looks like in real time. So the transcription project has this rotating carousel of uh, some of the newest documents that we've put up there. We like to keep it fresh and interesting. Um, if somebody wanted to click into and have a try at this piece of correspondence uh, from Governor Washburn um, during the Civil War, notifying the United States Secretary of War of the readiness of the Second Regiment to go to battle. Um, you see where it says not started. So that means this is free for transcription. Uh, you can dive in and it will probably block me here because I haven't actually logged in. Um, but anyway, it will bring up a, uh, oh, there it goes. Bear with me just a minute. I'll try to scroll down for you. So it's an original document here on the right-hand side and on the left, um, you can't see it very well. Um, it will appear much more distinctly when you try it yourself, but this is the, the sort of blank tablet where you can do the transcription. So you type it all in over here. Um, you do have the ability to enlarge the document uh, if something is hard to read. And then once you're done transcribing, um, it will ask you to check off whether it's complete. At that point, um, staff from the archives will take a look at it, just do a quick review, um, and then we will lock the document and place it, place the transcription up on digital main with its original. So this is a neat way for kids to engage with the collections and they can show off, hey, look, I helped the archives, I transcribed this document. I helped, you know, contribute to the historical record. Um, moving through quickly, I know that we're um, getting short on time here, so I'll go quickly through some of the other unique collections. Uh, Nikki mentioned our trademark collection, which is a lot of fun, um, and I'll give you a link for that in just a moment. Um, but these are fun. It's interesting to look at uh, <laughs> some of the medicines and some of the items sold within the state of Maine. Um, it's also interesting to look at the artwork, the development of advertising over time. So this has appealed to both younger learners um, as well as older learners tracing, you know, business development or advertising development. Um, we have a copy of the Declaration of Independence. I did notice just today that this is not on digital main, um, so I will be placing that up there this week. Um, our Civil War collection, one of the most comprehensive uh, collections of all the states. And uh, if you are studying the Civil War, I highly recommend that you dive into this. We've got correspondence by all the regiments. We have soldiers' portraits. 
Um, these are the carte de visites of the soldiers who fought for Maine. And these are, again, searchable by last name. And all you have to do is change the view on that one. We have hospital returns. Um, you know, sometimes that appeals to like middle school kids who like the gorier parts of history. Um, we have personal correspondence and diaries. So a lot of information uh, for kids to look at and observe. Um, again, example of a hospital return, carte de visites. We have Joshua Chamberlain. Um, we have Mr. and Mrs. Barrows. Um, Mr. Barrows was unfortunately lost at the Battle of Gettysburg, but we have correspondence from his wife to the state asking, first of all, what happened to her husband because she hadn't heard from him, and then secondly, you know, requesting uh, his pension to support her and her children. Uh, we do have a number of main records on family search um, as an additional bit of access. I'll show those to you real quick. Um, so these are all uh, the main records. Um, we've got naturalizations, um, probate files. Uh, somebody had asked about cemetery records. We do have those here um, on family search. We have this, the state archives. Um, this is where we keep all of the Civil War muster rolls. These were scanned by um, the Mormons um, a couple decades ago, I believe. Um, but you can really drill into uh, the different regimental muster rolls, um, as well as do a search for um, individual soldiers by last name. Um, and if you have any questions, I don't want to get too far into the weeds um, on that, but if you have questions, if you're studying the Civil War, um, please do reach out to me, um, and I'm happy to direct your students or you to um, the extensive collections we have um, on the Civil War. One more thing, uh, we have alien registrations. This is a, a little bit of an unknown part of Maine history, uh, certainly pertinent today where in uh, the summer of 1940, as the war in Europe was ramping up, uh, Governor Barrows determined that all residents of Maine of foreign birth had to register with the state. Um, these are interesting, not only from a genealogy perspective, um, but there's also a darker side to it in that we discovered in processing the collection that there was a, a correspondence section to the intelligence department of the state. Really what it is, is neighbors informing on neighbors. So if somebody suspicious moved into town or you didn't uh, trust the, um, you know, your, your neighbor for some reason, we had people writing in saying, you know, this person has a strange accent or this person is acting suspicious, taking photographs of landmarks in the area. So um, it's a little bit of a darker aspect of our main history, but certainly something that is uh, worth students investigating. Uh, I did mention the primary source sets um, that my colleagues at the State Museum touched on on Wednesday. Um, we have not yet put these sets on the main archives website, but we will be doing so um, shortly. For right now, they are findable through the Maine State Museum website. If you go under their learning link right here, you will come to, if you scroll all the way down, these are the packets that we've developed uh, in collaboration with the State Library, the State Archives, and the State Museums. And so they've broken them up by grade level. Um, for example, we've got Mapping Maine. Um, this is a fun one. Um, again, you can, there's a brief introduction, we have the primary sources themselves, and then what we call source labels, which is really uh, something that you wouldn't show to your students until the end because it's, it's the reveal at the end of the, the workshop. You know, it tells the student what it is that they're looking at. Um, the purpose of the design of 
these explorations is for students to kind of solve the mystery. They need to take a close look. Instead of being told what it is right off the bat, they need to take a look and examine it, try to figure out, you know, is it a map? What is it a map of? Who created the map? Why would they create the map? Who were they creating it for? Again, my little uh, favorite pointy map of Maine. Um, some other maps. And then, for example, the surveyor chains um, used by the early surveyors to go out and map. So this is uh, a bit of a puzzle to students. They don't quite understand what they're looking at. So some of the answers we've gotten back after you know, several minutes of close examination and inquiry have been really fascinating. Um, students often go in a direction you don't quite expect them to. So that's always fun. Heather, I hate to be the one because this, this- You're gonna cut me off, aren't you? All day. I'm gonna cut you off yeah, because there is something at two o'clock and I wanna make sure people have a minute or two to make sure that they can check the form that I just dropped into the chat box if you Perfect. need to contact our. Um, yep. If you're new in this one, please make sure you have the email, your name, and the answer to the last question is yes, that you completed the webinar and it will automatically send you something. Um, but let's also take a couple minutes. Does anybody have questions for, Heather? oh, you didn't even get to the virtual reality experience? That's okay. Um, are you sharing this at all? Or do you want to possibly look at scheduling another session to go into? Um, no, I can just talk really quickly. Uh, the virtual reality, obviously that was designed um, for in-classroom use because we have all the virtual reality headsets. We have gone out to a number of classes to test this out and it's been very well received. The kids have a lot of fun with it. Um, this is viewable on a desktop version. So obviously not the same experience as wearing the headsets, um, but you can get to those through the main Secretary of State website. If you click on State Archives, Bicentennial Projects, if you see down here, um, you can take a virtual tour of the State House, Old Orchard Beach, or Penobscot Narrows. So it's the desktop version, but still pretty interesting for students, and there is um, narration along with it. So that is an access point. Um, and also the main bicentennial moments, you've heard those on the, on the television and on radio, um, but those are a short 30-second uh, overview of different aspects of Maine history. Heather, is it possible for you to send me a copy of the presentation to share with everybody? You bet. Okay. So make sure if you... Um, complete the survey, it'll ask for an email, and I will pull some time probably after I get Heather to send me this off, maybe tonight. Um, I will send anybody whose email is in that survey, um, I will send them whatever Heather sends me. So we've got about two minutes. I will put in um, the form just one more time to make sure people have it right there at the top of the list. Does anybody have any questions um, for, Heather, you got a lot of um, good feedback in the group chat. That's wonderful. Thank you. What a great tour. Thank you very much. VR, yes. Thank you. Great information. <laughs> Loved it. Thanks so much. Um, does anybody have any questions for Heather while we have her? And I will reiterate again, um, please don't feel like, you know, just because you're um, isolating at home, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, if you're working on a, a social studies project and you need to ask an archivist, um, you know, I am monitoring emails. Um, I may not be in the office all the time, but I'm definitely checking emails on a daily basis. So feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help in whatever way I can as we sort of navigate through this new reality. Anybody, here's your chance, 60 seconds, ask an archivist. Sonia, Edith, Craig. All right, well, thank you. The good news, everybody is like laughing. Everybody whose camera is on, they're probably waiting for me to call on them at this point. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, Heather, if you can get that to me, I had some people requesting uh, double checking to make sure that they would get access to that. Um, Absolutely. I'll send that to anybody whose email I get out of the form. Um, and if you have any questions for Heather, you know how to get a hold of her. If you have any questions, um, you know how to get a hold of me. I'm gonna.